Eve, Friday before GDC, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Indy, and that's Jay Powell right next to me. He's uh, from Powell Group Consulting. And welcome to another awesome episode of Indie Game Business. Today, we've got Stuart DeVille. He's a CEO, GDL director at Fribbly Games. CEO at GDL and the director at Fribbly Games. And we're talking about running an indie game studio and many other many other awesome things so welcome Stuart welcome on this wonderful day the pre-GDC calm before the storm <laughs> chaosness um let's start where we always start uh tell us how you originally got into the industry and then walk us through your career up to this point yeah uh I mean I've been in the industry for uh about a decade now just over I think um so I'll try and give the abridged version. But essentially, when I uh, started, I came from a, a freelance background, a creative freelance background. Um, so I did everything from like graphic design, illustration, um, and anything that a freelance artist could do, I, I was doing basically. Um, and then I discovered uh, 3D uh, rendering software Blender um, and just became obsessed with like turning all of my character illustrations that I'd been doing for years into 3D models. And then I realized that, oh my God, this is my path into games. I'd never known that a, such a path existed. Um, and so my initial aim was to go and be a characterized in a AAA studio. So I just spent uh, like six months just doing everything I could to yeah, make sure I had an amazing portfolio, get into the industry. And I was coming up against the, the same barrier that most people still come up against now, which I find quite shocking, which is that um, every job I applied for was asking for me to have worked on some shipped titles. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Um, and then at the time, this is how long ago it was, Blender had a game engine. Um, so I thought I would try and make my own games and try and ship those. Um, that went horribly, horrible, horrible. It, it wasn't great. <laughs> uh, Blender's game engine uh, was unloved and uh, not kept up to date and... Um, I, I just kept breaking stuff, but I spent a very long time creating all of the assets for the game. Um, and then fortunately I met a friend who was like, you should work with my brother. He's been making mobile games, but he can't, uh, on the image side, he's in what, the best term I can put it was, he's not good. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sounds like a match made in heaven. So we teamed up, uh, and within four months we'd launched a mobile game. Um, he just wanted to do programming and I did everything else. Um, and from that process, I was like, huh, why am I killing myself to go work in a AAA studio that is really hard to get into when I think I could maybe do this myself? Um, I then uh, built my own studio. Um, that studio uh, kind of mostly got killed off by COVID lockdown. Um, and then I took a year out um to teach so i was a game design lecturer for a year um and i didn't know if i was going to come back to games and then spoke to a friend of mine who was like you didn't fail if you try if, if you try again and so i was like okay um and so now i'm with my i've started a second studio and in amongst all of that um i um i started game of london um with a couple of friends of mine um and yeah and it's that's that's kind of that's the shortest version I can possibly give, I think. Uh, I, I like you don't you didn't fail if you try again. That's um yeah, that I is literally, a good but <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is he was an investor and I was like I, I, I was talking to him going, look, I, I took my shot, right? I failed. I I, I guess I, you know I tried, but I'm out, right? I, I failed. No one's gonna wanna like hire like no one's gonna wanna put money behind me now. And he was like, You're an idiot. Uh you're actually more you're you're a safer bet. You, like all of those mistakes you made that led to the failure of that first studio means that your second studio is a safer bet. And he's not wrong. Like what I achieved in those five years running my previous studio, I've just done that and more in like just over a year. Um, just over, just under a year, somewhere somewhere around about a year. So yeah, you, you learn and it's especially five years worth of hard earned lessons. Um, so yeah, he, he was right. I just needed, I don't, the only way that I failed is if I just went, I quit and I'm out. Yeah. So I came back. It, it, we had somebody, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, mentioned the fact a couple of weeks ago that 
the studios that a lot of investors go for are the ones who have people who failed because they know, okay, look, we did this wrong. We can, we can fix that part of it. And, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning and, you know, the whole premise is, it's like, well, what if I fail? And I'm like, well, that's a real thing. It's like, I've done it. I mean, you've done it. I mean, it, it happens to everybody. This is not an easy industry by any means to, you know, get buy in, but, you have to you have, you you have to have a backup plan. You can't go and mortgage your entire house and everything else on it, you know. But I mean, failure is a very legitimate option, and that's what a lot of people are going to hit. But it's not the end of the world. No, and I think the other thing is um, that one of one of the things that I talk about like a lot now, especially with, like with the people that I mentor through, like you know, just setting up a studio and stuff. Um, it's that realistically you want to hit your failures earlier on and you want to be like testing what you're doing as early as possible. And a, a, lot, a lot of it comes from like not even knowing how, how you might do that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of this case of like, oh, uh, I've got to protect the, the thing that I'm making, got to keep it safe, like don't let anyone see it, <laughs> um, which I'm sure everyone experiences. And to a certain extent, yeah, you do want to, you know, make sure that you're protected. But at the same time, if you're not showing it to people and getting people like, and I mean like external people um, from all over the place, getting feedback and going, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And getting any, if you're not getting some someone going, oh, I don't know, or like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just giving you some like constructively negative feedback and, and you're just working in a silo. This is why I spent five years, like with my first studio, just with my head down, like taking on the weight of everything, every decision that I was making, just like piling up on me, um, not really not talking enough to like my industry peers. Um, and even those who were like, who I was friends with, um, who were like running their own studio and stuff, our, our conversations, like when we meet up in public and we're always kind of more like, let's catch up and never really like, damn, this is hard. I've got all of these problems. <laughs> and, <laughs> Whereas now I'm just so happy to vent and to hear other people vent and just be like, tell, yeah, tell me what's going wrong. Like, cause I've probably either have had it or I'm going through it and I might have like ideas and help each other out. And that's one of the things that our industry does really well, like helping each other out. It, it, it's one of those things that I tell people constantly, especially on our discord, which I will say for folks listening is a very safe place to go and rant. And I just sit here and thinking, and I'm like, Pebs, maybe we need a mental health rant channel on the board just so people can get off their chest sometimes. But whatever you're going through in this industry, the probability that you're the only one who's ever dealt with it is nil. I yeah. mean, it's absolutely infinitesimally small. And so it is one of those things. And a lot of people are you know, they don't want to talk about it because it's like, well, maybe I'll be, people will think I'm a failure or people will think I suck at this. And it's, it's just, no, you're not. I mean, this is a very, very tough time. I was just sitting here scrolling through, you know, companies that are going to GDC and, and meetings. And it's like, it seems nine out of 10 of them are developers that are looking for investors and publishers. And there's only so many investors and publishers out there. So it, it's a, tough industry in the first place but then everything's been going on this year and second half of last year makes things worse in a sense but it also gives opportunities too you know you and i were just talking right before we went live about the number of new publishers that we're seeing pop up yeah. and so no it's not easy but at the same time if it was everyone would do it right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think th there's also like this like weird flip side where there's a lot of people who are emboldened by going, well, I've made like a game, so I can I can if I can make a game, I can run a studio, um, and then you go, well, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, may maybe, but maybe not. Like maybe you need someone who is like like studio company business minded, um, and you can focus on making that great game. Um, but yeah, I think with the with the publishers, um, I'm really glad that because I've I've not seen as much as you have in terms of the, the new ones popping up. But I I definitely saw, yeah, we lost ten percent of publishers um, 
and investors are being more cautious, especially things like it used to be easier if you were like a team of AAA guys um, who just left a studio to start your own studio and the investors would go, oh, yeah, they're AAA, they're, they're like creme de la creme, they're going to make a big splash on the scene, they give them a big load of money and then that studio crashes and they go, oh, why did that cr studio crash? Because they didn't know how to run a business. They know how to make a cool game, but they didn't know like the business side of it. So like that's no longer a thing <laughs> uh, uh, and investors are just being a lot more like as as you would you know you get you get a little bit burnt here and there you lose a couple of million you kind of go oh we should maybe be a bit more stringent about this but it does just mean that um if if you know if you take it seriously then you can still go to those publishers or, or investors and you can go look i i've looked into this i've, I've done my homework i'm a safer bet I'm not like trying to run off of the fumes of like, like where I used to work or whatever. And that does still like have good standing, like don't get me wrong. It does show that you you might have a, a better ability at making a, a stronger game. But we've also seen people who have had like next to no experience making a game do really well. So, you know, that it's a real mix of a, a landscape. It's, it's, it's very, I think it's easier right now to get a publisher than it is to get an investor because yeah. investors are, one, they're the ones that are going to get involved very, very early. That's harder to do. Plus interest rates, things that are completely out of our control are high at the moment. And so that's going to discourage a lot of this as well. But there are a lot of publishers popping up. Um, it's just a matter of doing a little bit of homework, you know, figuring it out, go to our website, get the publisher list. It's accurate as of up to about a month and a half ago. Um, and yes, I, I, it, it will say 2023, but we updated that thing at the end of 2024. We just haven't had a chance to change the graphic. <laughs> um, yeah. But the other aspect of it is I still say, I said this a couple of months ago, and I still believe it very, very heavily. In the next 12 to 16 months, we're going to see a lot of really good indie studios coming to light with, with projects and things like that. And so it's because we see a lot of these layoffs and we see a lot of this, everybody's like, okay, there was someone just posted in, in the discord, you know, said, I'm absolutely the same point. He was talking, talking about you. I've been trying for years to break in and all of these AAA studios start causing mass casualties. And I'm like, nah, it's possible without the behemoths. And it is hmm. if you plan and do it right. So, with that in mind and a lot of the companies out there right now that are looking to start something where should they start what are some of those like hard hard lessons learned that you went through that say okay plan for this initially um yeah so i would say for me right now if i was to start from scratch right now bearing in mind i did start from scratch only just like a year ago <laughs> um i and, and even 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 with that like if i started again tomorrow i would still start slightly differently um uh, we, we're doing really well at staying small right now. My, the first mistake I made with my first studio was that I went from a two-man team to a 20-man team in the space of two months. I had, wow. I had like, um, at one point I interviewed 20 people over two days back to back. I don't recommend it. Um, but, the, the, but that did give me, the, the, here's the thing, like from, from all of that, like I did take away from that. I got like really good at interviewing people. I have such a strong like gut sense while I'm interviewing people now. And there are just it, like, I, it comes to my mind, like a question that I can ask that will get them to tell me something about themselves that allows me to know who they are. Like, so that's like a whole thing, but um, staying small, um, as small as you can. Um, and, um, and the other thing that I would say is um, test out a, um, make as many prototypes as you can. I mean, this is kind of out there already. Like some people do know this, but there's also conflicting information out there on like, oh, do you, do you f f make come up with your, you know, spend three months in pre-production, make that thing, or <laughs> make ten like scrappy things, try it out with friends and family, see if any of them come up with like a really cool quirky thing, um, and and then this is something I don't know if is out there that is whether or not it's out there as much. Instead of going like, oh, this would be cool with this and this. Um, during that that early build stage process, always be thinking, could we go to market tomorrow? 
like, is this enough of a game that we could actually launch tomorrow? Um, you know, we might need to polish it up or whatever, but if we like, w can we launch this as a demo that people might pay for? Like start doing all of that early, early testing, putting stuff out there and just pr trying to prove that what you're doing makes sense. It's, again, it's like this whole, like don't keep everything a secret to yourself. Um, and I think the one thing that stops people from doing that is that they're worried someone else is going to steal their, their idea. And the reality is that even if someone sees like out here the idea that you're putting out, they don't know all of the decisions that you like had to come to to decide to make that. They don't know how you're making it in the back end. They don't know what your plan is with it going forward. So no matter what you're showing up here, there's a whole like 80% of this iceberg that people aren't seeing. So just start throwing stuff out there, testing it, um, and try and find simpler ways to test your ideas. Um, there's a lot of people who do really well on things like um, pitch your game on Twitter, um, where they like pitch a game idea and it, like loads of people see it, loads of people vote on it. And it turns out that actually it was just like some cool imagery and it doesn't exist yet. Like, <laughs> yep. and then they, they've just proved that like, yeah, two 2000 people really loved it. And, uh, and if the best case scenario is that, you know, um, someone in the judging team picks their tweet and goes, this was a really solid, pitch and a really solid idea and we'd love to see more of it and then you go you can take that um to a publisher you can take that to an investor and go look i've kind of proved already that the market is out there and they want it so these are the things that i would say are really stuff that you can do early stuff that is easier to do than to dive into any form of like production that could take you forever <laughs> And, and something like itch is a really good way of yeah. you know, getting that out there. It's like I, you know, there are pros and cons to going and selling something in early access on Steam or Epic or wherever. But I have never in my 25 years seen a publisher turn down a project because it was already on Itch.io. You know, it's like that is a very, very good place to test it. And then you can take that interest and you can funnel those people to your discord or somewhere else so you start building that community mm -hmm. but yeah it, it, I, I still get a lot of the whole well i need you to sign an nda and i'm like look i'm not i'm not signing an nda to hear a pitch because i literally have a database of thousands of games over here that are out there circling in the market right now and i can't guarantee you before i see yours that you don't have something similar to somebody else but it's yeah, your idea isn't what's going to get you a deal. It's it's the execution of that idea that's going to get it. So don't be worried about. It. Yeah, even on the other side, like you, um, if someone tries to steal your idea, like you're the, you know how you're going to market it and sell it. You might already have like gathered uh, the the people through um, a mailing list, and you've like started your Discord, and those people are going to pay for your game they're not going to go like wander off and pay for this other person's game that other person's game might not even ever do you know what i mean uh, and i also think that that fear is largely unfounded because me as a as a studio owner owner um if, if someone shares their game idea with me i'm already making my game i'm not yes i'm, I'm really i have enough busy. ideas <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm really busy making my own games other studios, we're all busy trying to make our own games, make our own ideas, make our own dreams come true. It, it would be so much more effort to try and figure out what someone else is doing and how how we might replicate and make it. Like you could kind of, you know, there are certain trends in the market that you can look for, um, you know, whether or not like um, RPGs or MMOs or don't go make an MMO, but like whatever the like, you know, the trending theme, game theme is, that's that you, you can kind of start trying to tap into that, but all, always be aware how big that market is and what your percentage of it would be. Um, and, you know, most of us, especially indie guys, like we're all looking for the little the little niche. We're going like, and I think most of us have niche ideas anyway, <laughs> because we're always going, well, that was cool and that was cool. And I love both of these. What if I took like those and made this? Like we're always doing that. So I think that's, yeah, that just remove your fear. It's probably like roads start. <laughs> we were talking about that internally a few days ago about how, you know, there are so many different things out there. And right now, I mean, honestly, Power World, fantastic example. Now you have to be 
cognizant of the fact that it's an indie game technically, but it's also a $6.7 million budget that they put into that thing. Mm -hmm. But you will not see a clearer example of X plus Y equals Z than when you play that game. I mean, it's yeah. got the sound effects and the fonts from Zelda. It's got all the Pokemon stuff in it. And it's got the skill tree and the tech tree of art. I mean, this is a studio that literally said, I like this and this and this, and we're going to put it all together. And this is what it is. Yeah. And, and they've had, you know, fantastic success with it. Um, it yeah. It's one of those things that, yeah. It's also a really good recipe for running your studio. Um, again, if I was to start tomorrow, I would look at some fun things that like, uh, well, I'd gather the team around the table and I'd say, hey, what do you love playing? What do you love playing? Here's what I love playing. Where is there something cool in here? Then um, if we find something cool that we want to work on, have a look at the you know, the industry, the market trends and stuff and see if there's a place for it, see if that can line up somehow. Um, because the, the strong element of that is that the whole team is going to want to build that. And if it takes a really long time and you have these financial struggles, everyone's going to be like, yeah, but we're making like the, the passion for the thing that they're making can help you like go however long it takes you to get out of there. Whereas if you're like, especially in studios where there's someone who's got like, this is my idea. Um, I don't want to hear your ideas. I just, but this is, this is what we're making. You're, if you come up against any kind of struggles, <laughs> your team's going to go, yeah, well, like it's cool, whatever, like, but uh, I'm going to go find some more job security elsewhere uh, on a, project that i might like to work on more because this is your game and i don't want to make it anymore so that's always a good like conversation to have at the beginning of your studio along the lines of the whole you know looking at the market one thing that a lot of folks don't understand is that you have to look at the market trends two years from now yeah. not what is right now you know because Right now, it's city builders, survival games, and for some reason, deck builders, well, I mean, I'll give them credit on that one. That genre will not die, apparently. I keep <laughs> waiting for it to die, and it it's won't. It's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. It's, it's, but you can't just say, okay, what's trending right now? You have to, like, plan out and say, look, okay, this is what's going to be going. And that's hard. It's not It's really hard. Yeah. easy. I'm not hating on deck builders. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's many a good deck builder out there. I love it's deck builders. I play a lot of them. I just I'm shocked at how many different iterations people come up with. <laughs> and it's like we've gone almost back to the drawing board or back to the beginning with Bellato because that's like a poker deck building game. And it's like I'm kudos to everybody. I mean, I do enjoy them, but Oh my God, it's amazing how many of them pop out. So question coming in, you mentioned that your, your question in interviews that goes really well, uh, Larry on Discord says, what is that question that you use in interviews to get the most out of <laughs> So well, here's the thing, it's never like, I, I always have like a set of questions that I'm going to ask. Um, because you, if you're gonna interview people, surprising, you know, you do, you do want to prepare somewhat. Um, and, it kind of evolved fairly rapidly and by the time I got to the point where so the thing that the reason why I interviewed 20 people back to back over two days is because um this is just around about when like uh lockdown hit well, uh, sometime shortly after um I, I basically lost most of my art team uh because some people like I like I, I some people on my team had come over to the UK um to, to find work and, and opportunities and stuff. And they were like, I want to go home I, and I'm on the next plane out of there. And I was like, okay, yeah, that, I completely understand. And they're like, and I don't like have the time to like settle that and figure out. And, and then I had other people who were like, the the, men, the pressure of the mental health of like, what is going on in the world? Uh, I, I can't sit down and focus on work. Like I'm just really panicked and worried and stuff. And so I ended up losing like most of my art team. And so I had to, quickly go uh, okay i this is fine <laughs> i'll just <laughs> i'll just replace people i can replace people replacing people is okay um and then yeah so i put a call out Unsur surprisingly unsurprisingly i got like a lot of people apply um 
and I had to whittle, whittle that down to like 20 people who are like, okay, these are fairly solid. Um, and then the, yeah, my plan for questioning kind of uh, just, I, I decided to stop going through all of the, like, I, I can see a good portfolio. I can look at a portfolio and I can go, yeah, you're going to make good work. That's fine. Um, but what I don't know is what kind of personality you have and whether or not you're, because the one thing you don't want to do, especially early on, is bring someone into your team who is going to be a ticking time bomb within your team and is going to be upsetting the other team members. And that feels like, well, surely we all, we all just love making games. That, that can't happen. Uh, trust me, it happens. Um, <laughs> so I started just being way more formal in my interview process and just talking like I would to anyone that I just met. So instantly, like their guard goes, Oh, I'm in an interview to, oh, I can just chat to this guy. This guy's cool. Oh, we can just chat. It's fine. I, yeah, he doesn't care. He, like, he, he's, I'm definitely going to get the job. Like, you know, <laughs> guard, guard rail down. Um, and then it just becomes a case of like um, asking them questions about their work um, that of kind of realistically, a lot of the time were, were fairly innocuous. Um, and if someone replied like instantly going, like super defensive and super tense and being like, oh, well, who, who the hell are you to like ask questions about my artwork? Well, he, well here's the reasons why I'm, uh, you know, and I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Um, I can imagine if I put you in my team, like straight away from that interaction, that if someone else comes on and goes, hey, we need to change things and like, can you redo this again? But they might be like, uh, no, I've done it. Like my work's amazing. Like why are you, uh, and that becomes conflict in your team and then you you have to find a way to like work that out for people and and that's not easily done no, <laughs> and it takes not. up a lot of time um and, but but here's the other the other side to that coin because um you do have to be careful that what you're not doing is removing uh people who have who will have different opinions and you know you you want this diverse range of opinions and perspectives um because otherwise you don't get any creativity and everything is shit so you have to be very careful that you're not wheedling out people that might disagree with you um on art styles and stuff because you have different creative perspectives because you do want that but what you don't want is someone who's just going to go like just, just be really defensive and um and aggressive or you know all of these kind of traits that you don't need in a creative environment you can have conflict and I recommend having conflict. Like quite, I'm I'm often asking um, my team, both at my studio and at Game of London, you know, if you, I want to hear, as, be as honest with me as you like. Um, and quite often people go, I'm sorry, I, that was really honest. And I go, no, no, that's no. like, I, I really, I need that. Like, I, I don't know what I don't know and I don't know what's going on in your mind. So yeah, that, it, I, I never really had like a, uh, a formula or a list of questions for like how I get that out of people. It just became something that I developed over interviewing so many people. Um, and realistically now, um, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of in a very fortunate position that I can go to networking events and, and I create my networking events so that I can meet people and I can have these very comfortable conversations with people and get to know them on a people level before I even get to find out that like they're an amazing creative that I might want to work with in some way. Um, and in a lot of ways, I've, I I can't remember the last time that I actually put out like a full on job spec in order to bring in new people. Normally I've met someone at a networking event and I go, I remember that person. I remember they were amazing. Um, and I'm pretty sure they were talking about this work and I thought that was really cool. And then I go and have a chat with them about their work. And then I go, oh my God, yeah, your work is amazing how would you like to come like work with me on whether it's like a project that I'm working on or whether it's my project or whatever the thing is. It, it's, it's a good point to talk about the other side of all these layoffs right now. And that's, you know, the situation that you're in the situation. We, we did the very same thing. We hired two people last year and it was the first two people out of our entire team that I ever put a job posting out for. And, because usually we had done, I had done the very same thing. I know you, I trust you. I know you can do this job. You want to come, you know, work for us. The, 
COVID basically showed the industry that we can work remotely and work well remotely. Mm -hmm. If you have that corporate culture that allows for that and you don't have a bunch of middle market managers who are trying to justify their existence, this works very well. So if you are going out and putting job ads out there, you're going to get a lot. We got 200 applications for our biz dev position. Mm -hmm. And that part of that was because that ad went out like literally two or three days after Embracer announced their first round of, of layoffs. So you need to be able to, you know, talk to folks and make sure they're going to fit in because you're not going to have as many opportunities to do it in person. Mm. I cheated. I know I can't interview people. I looked at my wife and I'm like, we're putting job ads out here and I haven't even had a job interview in 12 years. It's like, <laughs> I haven't been on either side of that table. She, on the other hand, has worked in HR for almost her entire life. And so I, she did and I was like, hey, why don't you come in and listen in on these interviews so <laughs> I know what I don't know type thing. Yeah. But it, it is, if, you know, if you're going out there and you're looking for new team members right now, this is another reason I think indie games are going to blow up mm -hmm. in the next year, year and a half is because there is such a talented pool and you're not limited to hiring in your own area code, zip code anymore. You can literally pull people from around the world if you have the processes and methodologies and and systems in place to to support it um yeah. it's yeah it's it's terrifying when you get that many applications and you're like oh, <laughs> shit what do you mean all of these people yeah um uh, yeah and it was the same yeah during covid because obviously it, like loads of people were laid off in in the like first couple of weeks when we were told to stay at home um because of how we were set up like a lot of my team were working part-time so like working at the studio in their like downtime and working full-time job uh part-time or full-time jobs um, and a lot of them were in like customer facing or like retail kind of jobs and those first two weeks they were told stay at home you're going to get paid and we were like this is incredible <laughs> <laughs> best thing ever <laughs> um and we had a yeah we had a production boost for like a solid month and i was like we're going to come out of like this pandemic launching a game Absolutely, that, like my, my head was like, abs without a doubt, absolutely. And then the realities of yeah being locked, like you having to stay at home um, and people's family members getting sick and then wanting to go like and join their family, like all that, all that chaos came into it. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, now I see the issue, yes. <laughs> and then, yeah, trying to onboard a whole bunch of people remotely, especially um, <laughs> I, I, I brought in, six people from the, those 20 interviews um and uh onboarding basically kind of just didn't happen it was like hey uh, hey, hey say hello to everyone hey, hello everyone perfect <laughs> um here's what we need you to be doing here's who you're gonna need to be speaking to um everything's on fire please bear with us <laughs> <laughs> um yeah just <laughs> chaos I, I, I i'm very lucky that like towards the end of lockdown um i financially i was like i just have to get a job um and i was it was kind of lucky that i landed a job as a lecturer um that required me to have a four hour daily commute like two hours there and two hours back because that wiped out any chance of me having any time to really like manage the studio properly like, like i needed to and we had the the final like barrel the final bullet in the barrel um was that i brought in um some new developers to like go through the code and um like work with like we were doing a pivot basically and they both said to me um we can't do that with this um we would have to start from scratch and i was like um okay okay yeah okay okay uh start from scratch um okay <laughs> uh and then like I, I spent like an entire month just trying to come up come up with a plan of how like how we could do this, how we could pivot, how we could change what we were doing. And every plan that I could come up with basically meant that I would need to come back to the studio full time. I can't go, here's the new idea, go. Like I have to go, here's the new idea, here's how this works, here's how, here's why we're doing that, here's how that's gonna do. Like every idea that I get, like scaling it back and stripping it down, like all of it just required me being full time. And I was like, 
I can't. Like, I don't have, I literally don't have the space for it. And so I had to turn to my team and be like, I have to end this here. Like, I need to go work full time. Um, I'd also did the classic thing that uh, quite a few people did during lockdown, which is had a lockdown baby. So I had like a new, a new, a new son to deal with. So I really just. How did that come about, Stuart? I mean, is there any any particular thing that led to that decision? <laughs> I mean, we always like we, I so I already had one son, and we we all we knew already that we wanted to have two. We knew we wanted to have two kids. We we knew we wanted to be a two kid family, um, and. Yeah, we like drinking during lockdown <laughs> and having a good time and just being like, okay, well, my, my partner basically was like, I, I'm, I'm pregnant. And like, do we do this now? Because this is like the right kind of age gap that we wanted, or do we not do this now? Um, and I was like, yeah, I guess, okay, yeah, I'm like, this was the plan all along. And if we don't do it now, when are we actually going to do it? Like, nature's kind of just gone, hey, Huh? <laughs> um, and we so, have nothing else to do at the moment. So, um... <laughs> and, then, and it just so and it just so happened that like yeah, it kind of it came at the right time, and I was already like up for this like new job, and I was like, I can take the new job. We can be financially secure, secure as you can be when you know you bring kids into the picture. Um, and so it just yeah, just I just painted myself into a corner with all of these eventualities, and I was like, yeah, I have to, I have to shut down the studio. Um, there were, I think there was like two people that kind of stayed with me to um, do work with me in other areas and other places. Um, and the rest of the team, I um, either helped them get a job somewhere else, like fairly much straight away, or, you know, I just said to them, I will support you with whatever. Um, and since then, I've both like supported some of those people and been references for them. So like, you know, I made sure that like that the, the closing down was done as best as I as I possibly could, considering the situation that I was in. Um, but yeah, the the outcome of that was that um, for the first week, I was like, oh, oh my god, it just felt so so shit i mean as you can imagine <laughs> but the following week i was i felt like relief like i i didn't realize i just spent five years with like all of these little things piling in on me and like covid obviously just compounded all of that and i'd always felt really responsible for all of the people that were like working with me um and to suddenly just be free of like i didn't have to think about game design i didn't have to think about how we were going to market i didn't have to think about a pitch deck i didn't like all of this stuff had just gone and i was like <sighs> and, I, and i think if i if i hadn't have been given like forced into that corner paint myself into that corner um then i probably could have tried to carry on going <laughs> um and it would have been a, a really long and slow and painful death because all of the mistakes that i had made along the way like had been compounding up to that point anyway. And that's why, you know, when it came to the, the crunch, I was just in that corner. So I can't, I just wish it had happened sooner, if anything else. I, so I, I could have gone, oh, wake up. I, I think that's a very common, I mean, I, I had the very, I had the same thing with my first job. It's like, I ended up leaving, but looking back, it was the very same thing. It's like, you don't realize how much stress is piled on you until that stress isn't there anymore. And then you're yeah. like, oh shit, this is like what normal people feel like during the day. But <laughs> I, I think yeah. that, I mean, cause I said the very same thing about, you know, six months after I left, I was like, oh my God, I should have left that place long before this, you know, cause yeah. it starts affecting your health, not only your mental health, but your health health. And it's, it is a, it's, it, it's a common thing. It's like, yes, you do. You feel like shit. Cause I'm the same way with my employees. It's like, I, I can't have this corporate vision of, okay, we're just going to lay people off and it doesn't fucking yeah. matter. I, I'm not built that way. And mm. so, you know, I'm very protective of my team too. And I feel strongly that when you hire somebody, you're making a commitment to them as well. And it, you feel like an utter failure for that first week after you have to close something down like that. Yeah. But that's what it, it's like that seven stages of grief. I think you just go through them faster than normal. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel a lot better now because yeah, you don't, a lot of times you don't realize. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, so let's talk about something a little more happier and bring the mood up a little bit before we inevitably kill it again. Um, <laughs> so networking. So you mm-hmm. you run Game Dev London. Yeah. Obviously not something global, but you know it is there in London. Talk about networking and why it's important to especially new studios. Uh, well, to new studios, uh, I, I would say, like as, like I do for my studio, it's where I find the people that I want to work with. So, like, straight straight out the gate, like, you, if you're meeting, you, you can meet people, you can make friends. I mean, making friends is, is a good start for any, <laughs> any networking thing. I've got way more friends now. In fact, uh, now at this point in my life, I have more friends that are, like, game dev friends than any of the friends that I had most of my like old 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 friends unless they're like super close to me i no longer really have any connection to it's all game dev people which is maybe a a blessing and a curse i don't know but um yeah it's it's where you will likely find a lot of the people that you will want to work with long term like we can meet each other online of course we can but it's just so much harder to gauge people if you've only ever met them online it's just you know you there's there's something very real about meeting someone in a physical space and feeling the space between you, like um, like there's like come some kind of static in the air or something. But that like you get to have like a real presence, and also you don't have all of the awkwardness that comes with like a video call. You're not actually making eye contact. You're staring at your computer or you're staring at an image of them on a screen. Like that, and I, and I think there's something very human about eye contact that allows you to bond better with someone, and and even like uh, when you are gelling well with someone, this is something that I, unfortunately, I now notice way more than I ever have before. And that's like body mirroring. And if someone is like mirroring your behavior, that normally they're doing it unconsciously. Hopefully they're doing it unconsciously. <laughs> um, but that, like that, that happens very naturally in, um, yeah, in a physical space and you can get to know someone very well. Um, and there's, there's not this like restriction to oh um we're gonna have to end this call in a minute whether it's because the platform doesn't allow you to do longer than 30 minutes or an hour or whatever or more likely because you're booked in like as a meeting slot and realistically you're gonna have to go jump off for another meeting or they're gonna have to go off and do something whereas when you're meeting in a physical space like that there's no all of the pressures off you can just chat get to know someone um i this is something that I always tell people is like whenever you are networking like don't go in trying to look for the opportunity don't go in like be aware that opportunities can arise but don't go in trying to be like here's my portfolio um give me a job <laughs> like just try and try and make some real genuine connections and uh, it's better for um people who are looking to get jobs as well like you want to have a genuine connection with someone that you might end up working with as opposed to like you've just tried to like force your artwork on them and maybe they have loved your artwork but then you find out that you don't want to work with them because they're not a very nice person so yeah that for me that's always like the the main benefit of networking is is just how well you can get to know someone and the opportunities that you can find um and then for for a studio directly like for studio managers, marketing managers in, in studios or whatever, whoever that person is who's responsible for making sure the game does well, um, you get to meet um, potential investors and potential publishers in a very relaxed setting. Um, so that, again, you can get to know them quite well and it makes it a lot easier when you come to them with a game idea that like they know you better, you know them better. I, I've always found of, of the pitching that I've done, um every time i pitch to someone completely new <clears throat> and i'm like here's my game blah blah, blah da, 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 da. um i i always by default without even try, <laughs> without even trying for the first five minutes i'm just like chit-chatting with them um and normally there's a little moment in there somewhere where they'll go that yeah okay cool so do you want to show me your pitch and i'm like oh yeah right that's why <laughs> that's why we're here of course <laughs> because I didn't have that opportunity beforehand. <laughs> so I've, I've tried to like, shoot, I, again, like not, not tried to, but like, I've just naturally, I'm like trying to do that um, connection building, which I think you can, you can do, but I probably end up doing it longer than I should do. So yeah, networking allows you to meet people 
meet these potential people um especially if you're going to like the, the uh, some of the, the bigger events and a lot of the time um if you go to like someone's talk or whatever um you're normally going to that talk because you want to learn cool stuff from them but you know you might it might be a talk from a publisher and you might be able to have a chat with them afterwards um and again never go up to them to be like hey i've actually got a game that i would love to pitch to always just try and get to know them a little bit um and it it also realistically kind of gives you a bit of an in like um th there's so many conversations that i've had with publishers where um they've mentioned like a game that they really love uh, or like you know some kind of information where i'm like oh ah, that's interesting because you know my game kind of does that a little bit and so i know like when if and when i want to go pitch to them that they're actually the kind of person that might be interested in my kind of game or you know or you speak to a publisher and they're talking about how much they love uh racing games and you know that whole epic like sports side of things and you're like oh my game's super chill and puzzly and there's no like that's the kind of game that they're not even gonna vibe with so probably don't pitch to them <laughs> um especially as you know some sometimes these are scouts that you're talking to and, and um the scouts are responsible for bringing different types of games to a publishing studio uh, um and um obviously some publishers are a lot more focused about the types of games they release in fact i think most of them really have have you know this is the kind of game that we publish because it's very hard to pub, like have your team publish different types of games but certainly scouts are responsible for bringing in those games and the type of games that those scouts like it's really good to know you know what are, what, what are the games that they like it, that's a wonderful point on the networking side about not going in and just like here's my portfolio yeah don't do it <laughs> just and, <laughs> because it is and we've said this in the past and, and folks that have listened and we were talking about it on whatsapp yesterday too at gdc in particular and these bigger shows so many people are going to be booked every 30 minutes for three four five days straight yeah you are going to have a better chance of being remembered for building a connection during that realistically 15 20 minutes that you have for a meeting then you are flying through a pitch deck and showing them you know a little bit of the yeah. of gift it, it's just reality I mean, we're going to forget a lot you're going you're gonna, to as a developer you're going to have to resubmit all this shit once we get back you know from the show anyway yeah use that time and the same when you go to all of these parties you, you know one use some common sense don't get hammered drunk at the party that's just going to be a problem but go in and just meet people don't worry about some tangible target of publishers that you need to talk to or anything else because that'll that'll work itself out yeah. um all right so along the lines of publishers being very focused versus being very wide um jared on youtube says when you're looking for new talent for a small team and you need to keep it small would you advise finding someone well-rounded and versatile or someone really good at one specific task um so there's a magic word that's going to come up here and that's it depends <laughs> everybody take a drink if, if, yeah if, if you're playing uh igb podcast bingo congratulations um <laughs> that's the center of square that's the um um yeah so a new small indie studio um i would say uh and you'll probably hear this term quite a lot uh, it's, it's fairly common right now and it's uh look for t-shaped people so that's someone who is a specialist in a particular area but um also ha is, has a generalist scope of uh skill sets um i personally am like one of those people i'm uh, a, a 2d 3d character artist um but i work across the um entire pipeline so i can work from 2d sketch right through to rigging animating texturing the full gambit but realistically my favorite bit and the bit that i will do very well is is the modeling phase of that or the des the design to the model like drawing some character making that character 3d although these days i've been doing it long enough that i can more or less dive straight into 3d <laughs> um 
but that but again that's that's what you're looking for you're looking for someone who um can do the one thing that they can do very very well but within a small studio you're going to need people who can uh hop on and do other tasks especially when you're like putting together simple prototypes um and in fact in the early stage of uh of start, starting your studio there's loads of assets that you can find online and lots of apps and stuff and new apps popping up all the time um uh which probably brings us into uh the <laughs> intrepid conversations about ai but like there's lots of new tools out there that are changing how we we can work and allowing us to um to work with people um who ha yeah who who can cross more areas in a small in a small studio you need to stay small early on in order to survive early on because um the the when I brought in 20, when I expanded my team from a two man team to a 20 man team, that's a lot of mouths to feed for a start. Um, but also the, the other mistake that went with that was, um, I thought more people is more production power, quicker timeline, like short, shortened timeline. Uh, and what more people means is more people, more people problems. Um, so, <laughs> so more, staying, more staying people, lean, yeah. Um, and so staying lean is like really important and, and yeah so I think so uh, uh, with my studio Fribbly um, I was very lucky that um, my um, game designer and um, uh, and game programmer uh, has a very strong marketing background and then my producer um, and marketer has a very strong marketing background <laughs> um, and then I'm the creative side of that basically so um, and like I say I, I cover I'm fortunate that I cover a very large expanse for the visual side of things so the question on AI was and I pulled it up too quick how much do you think AI will change the work atmosphere in the large studios and at the new studios? And we've already seen the large studios are using it. The guy at EA said like 60% of them. So AAA is a whole different world anyway. Let's yeah. look at it. And they're already, they're, they're already seeing the issues with that. I saw recently a post that I can't remember which studio it was, um, but uh, they tried to produce a game using basically mostly AI. And then they were like, oh, this didn't work. <laughs> This oh really it sucks. didn't work yeah the, we need people who are professionals to make a game oh that is a big surprise i i, um, I have these people ask and it's been going on for like the last year they're like when do you think ai can make a game i'm like ai can make a game now it's gonna yeah. suck but yeah. i mean it can it can make one if it needs to um and the the thing that so there's a couple of things with ai um i would say the two key things are um one uh, a, a lot i'm not gonna swear <laughs> a lot of the ai out there is not ai it's a smart algorithm uh, it's you know it's a very smart program and people know that ai is a buzzword and so they're trying to slap ai on their product it's not actually ai um and the other thing is that um at least for the time being anything made by ai um cannot be copyrighted so if someone uses AI to make an image, someone else can steal that image uh, or that, that design. Um, and so your copyright isn't safe. Someone can literally clone your game to like exact and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and if you've done it with AI, then they can also do it with AI. So it's a zero sum game um, trying to use AI in, on that level anyway. I've heard of some positive ways of it being used. And I do think that our industry needs to change the conversation around AI. We need to stop being led by the fear mongering of the mass media. Um, and the, just, just the fear mongering in general, like, oh, AI is coming for jobs. It's really not. <laughs> um, and like, it might get, it might get really good, sure. But um, realistically, what we need to be doing, I think, is embracing AI tools getting to know AI tools. The AI is not going anywhere. We're not going to stop that progress. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, new new AI tools and software is coming out constantly right now. You can't, you can't open up any app without seeing a new launch for a new AI thing. Um, so realistically, we need to be looking at what are the strong and good 
AI tools that we can in, like we could be using in order to make it uh, make our studios stronger, make our chances of success better, um, rather than just being like, I'm never going to use AI. AI, it's all it's just here to steal our jobs, because eventually someone using AI and someone using AI very well will be taking jobs. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think we I think we really need to change that discussion, and we need to kind of start doing it sooner rather than later. And we're already seeing, especially when it comes to art. <clears throat> The AI art stuff has been going on long enough that you can look at an image now and go, that's AI. Yeah. You know I mean, it's, and this is one of those things that tells you it's not like the end all be all because those AI images tend to look very similar in certain ways. It's like I can, I can look at, there's a lot of developers out there who are using AI for like a game logo <laughs> or even for capsule art. And you can look at it and go, okay, that's AI. Not that you know, not that that's a bad thing. I'm not saying yeah. don't do it. I mean, but your trade, your copyright thing is a very good point. If you pull it up on Dolly, and anybody else can do the very same thing. Um, but it's it's one of those things that yeah, like, you're right. It's not going anywhere, and yeah. and it's we use different tools internally too here, and it's not about oh my god, I'll get, I can get rid of one of my employees. It's more like oh my god, look at all the new sh we can do now with the people that we have and i think because... realistically the other benefit that no one really talks about too much is that it would be really great if my job was easier and i could spend more time at home with my kids yeah. like if i if i can bring in ai to like automate some of and like i said like a lot of this stuff isn't ai it's not thinking for itself like you're going run this program like hit go like it's not it, it's not thinking Hmm, how do I replace Stuart? It's just not doing it. <laughs> so if yeah, something that could give me more time, like more downtime, um, to spend my family to go on holiday, like and like for my workload to be made lighter and easier, like we we really should just be looking at how we can do that with these tools. All right, so we got time for one more before we're gonna close down and, and let you go spend time with the family. Uh, West the World Studio on YouTube says, for GDC, is it taboo to ask technical questions to a developer of how they coded some aspects of their game at a high level, like the battle system or level design? Uh, depends how pally you get with someone, really. Like, um, I've I've had, um, whenever I've met people, like artists and stuff out, out in the wild, um, inevitably we start talking about process and stuff, and they might show me something that they've done, and I go, oh my God, how did you do that? like just you know just genuine curiosity um so i think i, I wouldn't say it's a taboo to ask that stuff I, I would say you'd want some form of rapport before you you know don't just go um i've seen that guy's work online and i've always wanted to know how he did that hey hello i'm steve how do you do that like don't <laughs> don't do that <laughs> um but yeah i i wouldn't say it's a taboo for sure like we especially uh, and I'm always talking about the indie scene because I'm just fully entrenched in the indie scene. But like indies, we're we're all so open to talking to each other about our work. And yeah, like if if we learn how to do something cool, and you don't know it, but you'd like to know it, normally we'd be like, yeah, well, I I'll tell you how I did that. Yeah. No problem. That that is one of the the huge upsides to this industry or this aspect of the industry anyway is is that everybody is very much willing to share. The the one caution I would have for doing that at GDC is you have to keep in mind, you may not be talking to the person who actually did this. It's like mm. if, in all of my years of pitching, if I, if I had a publisher or investor asking how we coded that, I'd be like, I have no idea. I took Pascal in college. Okay. This yeah. is not my realm. Just make sure that you're actually asking someone who might know that would yeah. be. The, um, yeah. I have a broad overview of program. I've, I can't program. I've tried. I can't program stuff. Um, I, I can talk programming. I can talk big picture programming. I, I talk to programmers all the time, and they're like, "I've got this problem." And I go, "Have you thought about doing it like, me, like outside the box thinking way, as opposed to, like, uh, normally it's surely in engine. If you connected this to that, then you wouldn't have to code anything." And then they go, "Oh, because <laughs> a coder always looks for the code way to do things." But yeah. I would have no idea if someone said that. <laughs> Not my world. Yeah. Yeah. 
How did you code that? I don't know. No, no clue. No clue. Stuart, thank you so much. This thank has you. been awesome. I envy your week next week of quiet work and nothing going on and not running all over <laughs> downtown San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want to say one thing before we go. I rail on GDC a lot, but it is the time when you were talking about having so many friends in the industry that are that are in game dev. It is that that is the shining reason that I keep going to that show yeah. is because next week I do get to hang out with my friends. I get to see the people that I haven't seen in a long time. And that part I truly, truly enjoy the rest of it. I could give or take, but that's, anyway. that's why I make events so that I can go see my friends. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Wes is it? Look, I hope you wrote to me. You will absolutely be able to recognize me. I'll be one of only two people running around the entire city of San Francisco with a giant indie game business hoodie on. So if you see that hoodie, that's either me or Margarita. And I hope to God you can tell the difference between the two of us. But um, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart. This has been really good, you really good informative, and, and it's been a fun talk. Uh, I just want to do uh, check out our Discord if you're not on our Discord. It's discord.gg slash indie game business. Um, go to the website, go to uh, indie business.com, sign up for the newsletter, uh, check out the merch. We have a link tree link. So if you just have a pull up indie game business, uh, if you look that up for in Linktree, I'm going to put it on the screen so you can see it right there. That's where all of our links live. All of the social media, all of them. You want this merch. I know you do. You want this merch. It's awesome merch. And uh, if you're going to GDC, have an amazing time. All right, everybody. We'll see you when we get back at some point. Ed Stewart, thanks again, man. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.